I welcome you all the participants. All the participants for the web lecture on financial statement for non-corporate entities. I request to play the motto song of institute. Please place your hand on the heart. Yae shasukte shujagrati Yae shasukte shujagrati Kamam 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 Kursho nirmi manaha nirmi manaha Tadeva shukram tadeva shukradam I welcome all once again on the event of web lecture on financial statement for non corporate entities. And the, regarding the speaker, he is a well renowned speaker. He give, C. A. Nitta Ravi Kishore is a fellow member of Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. He is a practicing practicing for last twenty five years. He is also the member of Institute of Cost of Cost and Management Accountant of India. He holds a diploma in Information System Audit and Honors in System Management. He is faculty for Direct and Indirect Taxes for last several years and was faculty for auditing for some years. He speaks at seminar organized by branch of I C I colleges and various state bodies about current and emerging technologies. He is faculty for orientation program of newly qualified cost accountants. He is also YouTuber. His channel Learn with Kishore. Currently, he has more than 5,600 subscribers. He is elected as elected to the managing committee of branch of SIRC of Vijayawada for two consecutive terms, 2019 to 22 and 22 to 25. For the year 24-25, he is a managing. He is the chairman of Vijayawada branch of SIRC of ICIA. During his tenure in managing committee, Vijayawada branch received three national awards and one SIRC award for the members and two times SICA, SICASA award for the students at SIRC. He is currently chairman of Taxation Committee of Andhra Pradesh Chamber of Commerce and Industrial Federation of State Level Bodies. So with a, such a welcome, so with a, such a uh, brief introduction of our speaker, C. Anita Ravi Kishore, I hand over the conference to C. Anita Ravi Kishore. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Manish Jain for those uh, kind words. Friends, good evening everyone. The topic what we are going to deal today is with regard to the financial statements for non-corporate entities. Before going into the topic per se, let me tell you that the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India has released a technical guide on financial statements for non-corporate entities in the year 2022. Thereafter, in the year 2023, the Institute has released a guidance note on financial statements on non-corporate entities. Whatever we are going to discuss in this session is based upon the technical guide and the guidance note issued by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. Now let me share my screen. Uh, so friends, as already said, our discussion is going to be about the financial statements for non-corporate entities based upon the guidance note issued by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. Friends, we will, dis we will divide this session into two parts. First, we will have a conceptual understanding of the topic, which will be a major part. In the second part, we'll be going into the 
financial statements format per se. So first, uh, let us spend a major amount of our time for conceptual understanding of the topic. Now, as said, the Institute has issued a guidance note. Now, what will be the authority attached to any document issued by the Institute? Our Institute has issued a clarification in this regard. Now, why are guidance notes issued first of all? The guidance note will be issued for a purpose to resolve the doubts arising in the minds of the members while carrying out their duties and functions. So basically, a chartered accountant, while discharging his duties or functions, be it a test function or otherwise, he may have certain doubts in his mind with regard to certain issues. So to clarify those doubts or resolve those issues, the institute will come out with certain guidance by way of guidance notes issued on various topics from time to time. Now, what we have to understand is whether the guidance note are mandatory in nature or whether the guidance note are recommendatory in nature. For that, the Institute has clarified that whatever guidance notes are issued, they are recommendatory in nature. I insist and once again reconfirm that the guidance notes are recommendatory in nature. Then should a chartered accountant comply with the content of the guidance note in respect of discharge of his duties or functions that we should understand. As we move forward, we will be able to understand each and every item. Now. The guidance notes may contain recommendations with regard to either auditing matters or either accounting matters. Whenever a guidance note is issued in respect of an auditing matter, ordinarily the recommendations given in the guidance note should be followed by the member. Whenever any guidance note gives any recommendation with regard to an auditing matter, the member should in almost all circumstances follow that guidance which has been given. However, if there are certain circumstances where the auditor is satisfied that he need not follow that recommendation, in a such a situation only, the recommendation need not be followed, which has been given in the guidance note. Sir, we will take up questions at a later point of our discussion. Ramohan Rao sir has raised his hand. I request him to hold his thought for a time so that once we go into a bit of our discussion, we will discuss about the queries which may arise. So having said that, as already discussed previously, our institute has issued a technical guide on financial statements for non-corporate entities in the year 2022. And thereafter, in the year 2023, a guidance note has been issued. Okay. Now, whenever in a guidance note, there is any recommendation with regard to a accounting matter, Generally, the preparation of accounts and preparation of financial statements, it is the responsibility of the management. Now, what the auditor will do? The auditor will audit the financial statements which have been prepared by the entity. So, the primary responsibility is with that of the management. Suppose, where a guidance note is with regard to a recommendation in respect of the financial statements, then it is the duty of the auditor to bring before the management with regard to the recommendation given by the ICI and ensure that those recommendations have been complied with 
at the time of preparation of uh, the books of account and at a later part at the time of preparation of the financial statements that we should understand. Now, what if uh, even on the recommendation given by the auditor, if that recommendation given in the guidance note is not complied with regard to the accounting matter by the entity, in such circumstances, what should the auditor do? The auditor has to make the disclosure in his report. Maybe it may also be by way of a qualification in his audit report. So to summarize as to what we have dealt with until now, we have a technical guide. Later, we have a guidance note. So what is the authority attached to the documents issued by the institute? The Generally, they have to be followed. The guidance note may comprise of matters relating to auditing or matters relating to the accountancy. If a matter relates to the audit, then auditor has to comply with that recommendation unless otherwise there are certain circumstances which he think that it need not be complied with. If it happens to be an accounting matter, the auditor may advise the entity to comply with the recommendation given in the guidance note with regarding to the accounting matter. Even then, if it is not complied with, the auditor has to consider whether he has to disclose such non-compliance in his audit report or he may have to qualify his audit report. Now, moving forward, what is the effective date of this guidance note? Previously, there was a technical guide with respect to the financial statements for non-corporate entities. Now that it is a guidance note. But this guidance note will come into effect from 1st of April 2024. Means for the financial year 2024-25, whatever financial statements we are going to prepare, that will be that financial statements should follow the recommendations given in this guidance note. Now, once uh, this guidance note comes into existence, the technical guide will uh, stand withdrawn. The, the date on which this guidance note becomes effective, the technical guide stands withdrawn. Okay. So generally what will happen is, as far as uh, our uh, institute uh, way of doing things, if first uh, technical guide which will be issued, first technical guide will be issued. Later what will happen? They may issue a guidance note. After guidance note, there may be standards in respect of certain items. So this is the chronological order. Technical guide, thereafter guidance note and thereafter standards. Okay. So once this guidance note has already come into existence with effect from 1-4-2024, thereby the previously issued technical guide stands withdrawn. Okay. Moving forward, the general purpose financial statements. So what are general purpose financial statements and uh, how they should be prepared? The general purpose financial statements should be prepared in accordance with the accounting standards. They should be prepared in accordance with the accounting standards. So what will happen if the financial statements are prepared in accordance with the accounting standards? Now, if accounting standards are followed while preparing the financial statements, they will give reliable information. They will give reliable information. So for what purpose reliable information is required? So that the users of the financial statements will be able to take informed economic decisions. So for the users of the financial statements to take economic decisions in a proper or correct way, the financial statements should be reliable. Now, how will the financial statements be reliable? 
if you prepare the financial statements by following the accounting standards, they become reliable. Thereafter, the user of the financial position, financial statements will be in a position to take a, a informed economic decision. Now, why did the institute prescribe the formats for the financial statements for non-corporate entities? The main intention behind prescribing these formats through guidance note is for the purpose of effective implementation of accounting standards. For the purpose of effective implementation of the accounting standards, these formats have been prescribed. Now, why does in first place the institute has released this guidance note? This guidance note has been issued for the purpose of standardization of formats of the financial statements. They want to standardize the formats. Let us say, for example, take the example of a non-corporate entity. A proprietorship is a non-corporate entity. A partnership firm is a non-corporate entity. A HGF carrying on business is a, or carrying out a commercial activity is a non-corporate entity. Now, under no law, financial statements have been prescribed for a proprietorship concern or for a though there is a partnership act the partnership act does not give the format for financial statements even the llp act also does not prescribe any format for the financial statements likewise given in the companies act schedule 3 all right so each partnership firm or each proprietary concern may prepare their financial statements in the way they like it. So, but what our institute has thought that there are accounting standards which are applicable. They want to implement those accounting standards and they want to standardize the financial statements of all the non-corporate entities. That is why this uh, uh, guidance note has been issued. Now, by standardization of these formats, what will happen? That will enhance the quality and comprehensive of the financial reporting. The financial reporting or financial statement should be reliable, for which they have to follow accounting standards in preparation of the financial statements. Now, once these uh, financial statements of non-corporate entities are standardized, what will happen is the quality of the financial reporting will increase. That is the main reason for which this uh, guidance note has been issued. Now, we may wonder as to who has uh, prescribed or who has uh, prepared these format of financial statements for non-corporate entities. The Accounting Standards Board of our institute has prepared these financial uh, uh, format for the financial statements. The Accounting Standards Board of our institute has prescribed these formats through this guidance note. Now, these formats, to whom these formats are applicable? Are they applicable to a company? Are they applicable to a LLP? Are they applicable to a proprietorship, HUF, or a corporation established under any central or state act? To whom these formats are applicable? These formats are applicable to all non-corporate entities. Friends, let me say you one thing. Maybe for small and medium enterprises, which is a non-corporate entity, means which is not a company or which is not a LLP. Let us take the example of a proprietorship. Now, in the Income Tax Act, while filing the return of income, if the income is offered under Section 44AD, then the financial statements, though the entity has prepared the books of account, 
and has prepared the financial statements, let us say, in tally. We all know that many of the small and medium enterprises, which are non-corporate entities or even such small companies will be using tally for the purpose of or tally or for that matter, any other software for the purpose of preparation of their financial statements. Now, let us say that uh, a, a proprietorship, uh, let us say A and Co, whose turnover is around 80 lakhs, is offering its income under Section 44 AD of the Income Tax Act. Now, though for the purpose of GST, they have prepared their books of account, for income tax purpose, at the time of filing the return of income, we will not be uploading any profit and loss account and balance sheet. But we may be preparing the profit and loss account balance sheet. The need of a profit and loss account balance sheet for a 44 AD case will arise when the bank will ask for the financial statements every year where this entity has availed certain cash credit or overdraft limit with that bank. Let us say it has a, uh, it has taken a, a 50 lakhs of loan or it may have taken 10 lakhs of loan for the purpose of carrying out his business, OD. At that time, every year this person might have to furnish the financial statements to the banker. In such a circumstance, how the financial statements are to be prepared? whether they have to be prepared in accordance with the formats that have been prescribed in this guidance note or simply by taking a profit and loss account, balance sheet, debtors, creditors, unsecured loans, bank accounts, advances, and the trail balance from the tally, just extract, extract from the tally, take a printout of it and sign and submit to the banker. Is it sufficient or not? is the question what we will be going to discuss at a later point of our discussion. Let us take another situation wherein there is a partnership firm whose turnover is 4 crores. It has to get his books of account audited because 5%, 5% cash transactions, it has not met that provision uh, which has been given in the Provisio 2, Section 44, AB 1. That Provisio has not been satisfied by the partnership firm. Thereby, it has to get his books of get its books of account audited under Section 44, AB of the Income Tax Act. Now, the books of accounts are maintained in tally. They have prepared the financial statements. Right, that too from tally itself. Now, you are conducting your tax audit. At the time of uploading your tax audit report, you should also upload your profit and loss account and balance sheet. Now, simply by extracting the P&L balance sheet from the tally, attaching it to your tax audit report while uploading on the CPC web portal, is it sufficient or is it in accordance with the guidance note issued by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India with regard to financial statements of non-corporate entities that we need to understand. So what it is saying is this format, whatever financial statements you are going to prepare, be it a financial statement of a proprietary concern which has offered its income under Section 44AD, or a partnership firm being a non-corporate entity whose turnover is around 4 crores, which is required to furnish the tax audit report and along with the tax audit report, the financial statements are to be uploaded. Those financial statements should also be in the format that has been prescribed in the guidance note. Now, whether you are required to comply with the uh, accounting matter, recommendation given in the guidance note already we have dealt with. If it is an accounting matter, it is a responsibility of the management. If it, you if it is not complied, you have to suggest them. And if we, even still, if they do not comply, a, a duty is cast upon the auditor to disclose that matter in, the in his audit report or he may have to qualify his audit report wherever appropriate. So, in a nutshell, the scope of this guidance note for 
format for financial statements of non corporate entities apply to all non corporate entities at a later point of our discussion what we will do is we will understand as to who are all non corporate entities but in certain cases in respect of certain non corporate entities you need not follow this format why because in respect of certain non corporate entities any law regulation might require that non corporate entity to prepare the financial statements in a prescribed format under that law in those circumstances it is not necessary for you to comply with this guidance note or the format given in this guidance note because a guidance note or a standard can't override the law by itself so law is supreme it has to be within the four corners of the law only so for a non corporate entity which is governed by any law or regulation if that law or regulation specifies the format for the financial statement then you need not follow this financial statement that is what it has been prescribed or any other specific format has been already been issued by our institute in that circumstance also the format given in this guidance note will not be applicable that we should understand now are there any examples where a law prescribes the format for the financial statement of a non corporate or are there any formats which have been already been given by our institute in respect of a non corporate entity we will check those examples let us take the example of maharashtra public trust rules the maharashtra public trust rules prescribes the format of financial statements of trust formed under the maharashtra trust act so in those circumstances what you have to do is you have to follow that format but you should not come into the format given in this guidance note that you should understand now another example where our institute has already prescribed the format for a financial statement of a non corporate entities let us take the example of educational institution we have a publication with regard to a the financial statements and bookkeeping of educational institutions given by our institute so in respect of an educational institute you go to that format but don't come into this format and uh, let us take the example of political parties so for political parties also our institute has given separate guidance with regard to the recording of transactions and maintenance of books of account and also the format for financial statements have been given in respect of political parties now in those circumstance if you are auditing the financial statements of a political party ensure that financial statements are prepared in respect with the prescribed format given in that technical guide or guidance note as the case may be now let us understand as to what do you mean by a non corporate entity there is a wide spectrum of non corporate entities in a simple way what we can do is anything which is not registered under the companies act you can take it as a non corporate entity to be very it may not be so easy or so precise but in a nutshell or in one way what we can do is anything which is not registered under the companies act erstwhile companies act or the latest companies act that entity carrying on a commercial activity what you can do is you can take it as a non corporate entity now what are all the examples you may go with the one by one you already know there is a sole proprietary hf partnership this we have already discussed previously now a partnership firm can be a registered partnership 
or a unregistered partnership. Next comes AOPs. AOPs may be of different types. For example, anyone which can't be regarded as a means it is a partnership firm per se, but it is not SSRI as such or those partnership firms which are not covered in our earlier slide, those partnership firms will be non-corporate entities. You have the example of a body of individuals. You also have the examples of a resident welfare association. Suppose there is an apartment consisting of 50 flats. All the flat owners will form a resident welfare association. It is a non-corporate entity. Then comes the societies registered under the Societies Act. Then comes the trusts. These trusts can be either private trusts or a public trust or registered or unregistered. All types of trusts will be considered as a non-corporate entity. Next comes uh, statutory corporations. So food corporation of India, for example, life insurance corporation of India, state bank of India. So these are all the or any autonomous bodies or authorities which have been set up. So RERA or you can take a CRDA. So there may be these are the authorities or bodies which have been set up or any statutory corporation means any corporation which is established under any state or a central law. They are not established under the Companies Act. For example, if, if they are not established under the Companies Act or because they have come into existence because of the a separate act, be it a central act or be it a state act. In those circumstances, those type of entities are also called as non-corporate entities. And if the law under which they are established they do not give, the law or regulation do not give a format for the financial statements, then you need to come into the format given in this guidance note. Okay. Also, any organization which is wholly or partly engaged in business or professional activity, that is also called as a non-corporate entity, and this format has to be adopted. There is an exception. Previously, we talked about one exception. That exception is the format is already given and the law regulation governing that non-corporate entity is one exception, 1A. 1B is our institute has already given a format uh, for that non-corporate entity. Then also this this. Uh, uh, format need not be followed given in the guidance note, that is 1B. Now we'll come to the second part, exception. The second exception is that any entity whose operations or activities are wholly charitable in nature, wholly or fully charitable in nature, then also this format is not applicable for them. So there are two exceptions to this format that we have discussed. Now, what about an LLP? LLP is a corporate form of entity. LLP is a corporate form of entity. There is a LLP Act. You know that LLPs are administered under MCA, Ministry of Corporate Affairs. Now, let us say there is an LLP Act. Does the LLP Act prescribe the format of financial statements? No. The LLP Act do not have something called as Schedule 3 as given in the Companies Act or Air Schedule, schedule 6, something like that. There is no schedule in the LLP Act which will prescribe the formats given for the preparation of financial statements. Now for LLPs, whether the formats given for non-corporate entities are applicable or not. No, it is not applicable. It is not applicable. Why? Why it is not applicable? Because they have a separate set of 
formats which have been prescribed by our accounting standards board so for llps you have a separate set of financial statements that have been prescribed previously there used to be a technical guide for this for financial statements for llps now that at par with non corporate entities another guidance note has been published or issued by our institute prescribing the financial statements for llps but these formats are not applicable that is what we have to understand now friends for any financial reporting the results or the outcome of those financial statements they should be comparable they should be transparent they should be complete and they should be unbiased for any financial statements or for that matter any reporting those financial statements should be comparable those financial statements should be transparent they should be complete and they should be unbiased friends uh, before moving forward into our discussion let me draw your attention to one of our uh, institute uh, publication called framework for preparation and presentation of financial statements friends the accounting standards will also be based on this framework for preparation and presentation of financial statements this is the mother document or base document upon which the financial statements have been how to be prepared now this uh, is uh, available for uh, download in our institute website and also this will be a part of uh, if you have procured the accounting standards book from the institute in the preface itself you will have this uh, framework for preparation and presentation of financial statements now this framework for preparation of uh, financial and presentation of financial statements itself says states that what are the objectives of financial statements what are the underlying assumptions and what should be the characteristics of the financial statements in the framework itself it has been prescribed that the financial statements should possess certain qualities what are those qualities first of all they should be understandability if someone a user of the financial statement if he is reviewing or seeing those financial statement first of all that layman should be in a position to understand the content that has been given in that financial statements that is the first thing what we have to understand they should be relevant because they should be prepared in accordance with the concept of materiality they should be reliable and they should be comparable so these are the basic characteristic features of a financial statement that has been prepared by an entity where it has been given it has been given in the framework for preparation and a presentation of the financial statements issued by our institute which is the base document even for the purpose of preparation uh, uh, for the purpose of issue of accounting standards also the base characteristic features arise or are taken from this document and also friends you already know what accounting standards uh, do they give every accounting standard gives us three important consideration what is the first consideration whether you have to recognize that item of asset or income or liability or expenditure so recognition principle it will establish once it is established that that item has to be recognized then the question of measurement comes 
how it has to be measured. Once it is measured and recorded in the books of account, then comes the issue of disclosure. So each accounting standard tries to establish these three things. That is recognition, then measurement, and thereafter disclosure in the financial, what are the disclosure requirements in the financial statements. So this is the one of the base document which has to be kept in mind for the purpose of presentation or preparation of financial statements. Of course, all those principles given in that document will be taken care by the accounting standards. And we already understood that accounting standards are to be complied with for the purpose of preparation of financial statements. Friends, what are our accounting standards after all? They are a set of principles. They are a set of principles. It is a standardized language. It is a standardized language. What will these do? They will communicate high quality of information in the financial statements that we should understand. Now, on what principles the accounting standards are based? They are based on transparency. They are based on consistency. They are based on comparability and reliability. So these are the four principles on which the accounting standards are based. Now, the accounting standards are to be complied or followed by the entities, by all entities, be it a corporate entity or be it a non-corporate entity. Of course, it may take some time to come into terms that uh, the accounting standards are also applicable for non-corporate entities. But friends, this is a fact which we have to discount. Each one of us have to discount. So the accounting standards are set of principles which are required to be followed by all entities in the preparation of their financial statements. That we should understand. Next. What do financial statements disclose? They will give the financial position, means balance sheet. And they will also demonstrate the financial per performance of the entity. With that being a profit and loss account. And financial position is given by the balance sheet. So the profit, the financial performance will be a particular for a particular period. And of course, the state of affairs uh, will be as on a particular date as represented by the balance sheet. Now, friends, we understand that the financial statements prepared in accordance with the accounting standards give a reliable information. Thereby, the users of the financial statements will be in a position to take informed economic decisions. That is what the statement which we have come across at the beginning of our discussion. Now, who are the users of the financial information? Of course, we all very well know when it comes to non-corporate entities, what we deal in our day-to-day -day practice, the Users of the financial statements, of course, income tax department is one department who is the user of the financial statements. Of course, the entity might have taken loan, be it a cash credit or a term loan or a overdraft limit from a banker, be it a private bank or a public sector bank. They will be requiring the entity to produce the financial statements periodically. Of course, we know these two type of uh, uh, users of the financial statements. Now, let us understand, are there any other users of financial statements? Of course, for corporate entities, you have the shareholders, regulators like MCA, SEBI, etc. And you also have the potential investors if the entity is going for further issue of capital or it is coming to the market for the first time or for the first time, of course, there will not be any financial statements. That's for sure. If it is going for further issue of capital, uh, then 
the uh, potential investors might be interested in the financial statements of that entity. Then comes lenders, creditors, and other stakeholders. So these are all the users of the financial statements of a, a corporate entity. Now let us come to the case of a non-corporate entities. Who might be the persons who are interested in the financial statements of that non-corporate entities? Of course, you have potential investor. There is somebody who want to, of course, a non-corporate entity is not only a property concern HF or a partnership firm. We previously understood that the non-corporate entities are having a wide spectrum. They not only include the proprietorships, partnerships, HFs, but also they include AOP. They include trust. Apart from that, we also understood that corporations established or any authorities or any other board or entity which has been set up by any government, be it a state government or a central government. Now, let us say there is a corporation in which somebody wants to make an investment. Now, that potential investor is interested in the financial information of that entity. Then come employees, lenders, suppliers, creditors, customers. So, these are the users of the financial statements. If it happens to be, if an entity happens to be a corporate entity, then the financial statements format is already prescribed for that corporate entities in the Companies Act itself. By way of a Schedule 3 to the Companies Act, there you have the format itself. Of course, we also have the uh, institute publications with regard to the giving guidance in respect of Schedule 3 also. Now, what about non-corporate entities? Because these non-corporate entities are not generally governed. Most of them might not be governed by an act. For example, a pro most of them in the sense, most of them might be governed. But those rules or regulations might not have given the format for the financial statements, right? Let us say if you take the example of proprietorship, there is no uh, uh, separate law dealing with proprietorship firms. Partnership, you have an act, LLP, you have an act, but you have a separate uh, uh, set of uh, format for financial statements. Then you have this HF, no law governing except the Hindu Succession Act. Then if you come... Uh, uh, to trust, yes, of course, societies, yes, of course, there is a law. But uh, these laws might not have provided the format for the financial statements. Okay. So, friends, I thought uh, I have covered a good extent uh, by this time. If uh, uh, anyone uh, uh, wants to pose any query, or want to express their idea with regard to as to what I have uh, delivered until now, you are most welcome. Uh, sir, uh, Ramon, sir, you have raised your hand right from the beginning. Uh, Ramesh, if you can allow Ramon, sir, to unmute himself and speak. Ramon, sir, you want to say something? Or you can even post uh, in the chat box also. You can even post in the chat box also. Right. So moving forward, moving forward, previously we understood that financial statements are to be prepared in accordance with accounting standards. If they are prepared in, in accordance with the accounting standards, they, they, they get the reliability. They will become transparent. They will become reliable. They will become comparable. Now the question comes whether the accounting standards are applicable to a non-corporate entity. 
what are all the accounting standards that have been issued by the institute of chartered accountants of india are they applicable to a non corporate entity is a question friends i understand some of you might be thinking as to when we will be going into the format as or for the benefit of those who have joined late i would uh, suggest that we will be dividing our conversation into we will be dividing our concept conversation into two parts once uh, we get a conceptual understanding of uh, uh, what this is then we will go into the format per se yeah cs saumya states that as discussed trust need to follow format but organization fully charitable nature need not follow the matter it is includes organization other than the incorporated as trust so friends what we have discussed earlier is a non corporate entity need not follow this format if it is wholly charitable in nature even if it is partly charitable in nature and partly commercial in nature these formats have to be followed be it wholly charitable partly charitable partly commercial it has to comply with the trust act once it is a trust if it happens to be a trust it has to comply with the regulations given in that trust act that is the way in which we have to understand okay now moving forward moving forward whether accounting standards are applicable to a non corporate entity yes they will apply they will apply to any entity engaged in commercial industrial or business activity then accounting standard will apply when an accounting standard will not apply to a non corporate entity means if whole of the activity whole of the activity is not commercial means if it is fully charitable it is fully charitable then only the accounting standard does not apply even if it is partly charitable and partly commercial then also the accounting standard shall apply to that entity now if an entity for an entity which is partly charitable and partly commercial to which part the accounting standards will apply it apply to all activities it apply to all the activities okay it will apply to all the activities next moving forward what are the types of accounting standards now does all of you agree with me that accounting standards are applicable to non corporate entities also i am making a statement that accounting standard is applicable to a proprietorship firm which is preparing its financial statements do all of you agree or anybody does not agree with me then please post in the chat box if you don't agree that the accounting standards do not apply to the financial statements prepared by a proprietorship you may post it in the chat box or even if you agree that they are applicable to in a, a proprietorship even then you may also post it in the chat box be it yes or no friends it is applicable it is applicable why and from when is the question why it is applicable and from when it is applicable that we will understand yes some of you are repl have replied that the accounting standards are applicable to even to a proprietary concern which is a form of non corporate entity 
Now, friends, for this purpose, let us go into a let us go into a decision of our institute with regard to the with regard to the applicability of accounting standards to non corporate entities friends the council in its 400th meeting the council in its 400th meeting of course charitable ancillary activity for example ttd tirumala tirupati devasthanam is there it prints uh, diaries and it prints uh, calendars which is an ancillary activity and which is not a main activity in those circumstances it will not be treated as a partly charitable and partly commercial in my view right now the institute has come out with an announcement the institute has come out with an announcement in its 400th meeting in its 400th meeting which was held on march 18th and 19th of 2021 and it has come out with a scheme the scheme for applicability of accounting standards to non-company entities will come into effect in respect of accounting periods commencing on or after 1st of april 2020 right Yes, definitely I will post it. The presentation, etc. I will definitely share. No issue. The council at its 400th meeting has taken a decision that the accounting standards will be made applicable to the non-corporate entities for the periods commencing on or after 1st April 2020 that we should understand so what are all the accounting standards that are applicable to non-corporate entities whether all accounting standards are applicable to all entities let me give an example of a partnership firm having a turnover of 40 lakhs it is not going into 44 ad reporting because it has not earned uh, that much of profit and it don't want to go into 44 ad but it want to get its books of account audited by a chartered accountant, prepare the financial statements and submit along with the return of income. And also the auditor has to upload those financial statements along with his audit report. Now, is it fair enough or is it feasible that such entity should comply with all financial statements? Is it feasible and is it practicable for that small partnership firm having a turnover of 40 lakhs to comply with all the accounting standards? Is it feasible? It is not feasible. So friends, we will discuss about those things. Now we have got the authority by which I am stating before you that all the non-corporate entities have to comply with the accounting standards. So with what authority I am stating that or making that statement? By the decision of the Central Council of the Institute in its 400th meeting. They have stated that the accounting standards are made applicable to non-corporate entities for the periods commencing on and from 1 for 2020. So from financial year 2021 onwards, it is mandatory that the non-corporate entities should follow the accounting standards while preparing its financial statements. So friends, moving on to the next part. So how many types of accounting standards are there? There are basically three types of accounting standards. One is the NDIS, which we already know which are applicable to certain classes of companies. There comes 
Next comes the accounting standards applicable to corporate SSC, corporate entities who are under the company side. They have to follow the accounting standards as prescribed uh, by the MCA. Of course, those accounting standards will also be formulated by our institute itself. And then comes the third set of standards, accounting standards prescribed by ICAI. In its 400th meeting, council meeting, which are applicable to entities other than companies. Now, entities other than companies are non-corporate entities. Entities other than companies are non-corporate entities. That we have to understand. So, basically, there are three sets of accounting standards, NDS and those accounting standards prescribed by MCA and those accounting standards prescribed by our institute to, to come entities other than companies that being non-corporate entities. Of course, friends, I need not explain to you as to uh, which companies the NDAS is applicable. I will skip that because it is not relevant for our today's discussion. And also the second set of standards applicable to companies other than those who have to comply with the NDAs, that also I will skip as you already are well aware of those applicability of standards. Of course, SM small and medium companies will have certain exceptions as far as certain standards are concerned. So friends, <coughs> We already have gone through what is the announcement that has been made by the Institute in its 400th Council meeting. And they have made applicable the accounting standards to non-corporate entities. And these are issued by ICA and these are applicable to the non-corporate entities. So what is the announcement? Also, we have gone through that. Moving forward, we already understood that these accounting standards will be applicable for periods commencing from 1st of April 2020. So friends, moving forward, previously we had a thought that is it fair enough that a partnership firm being a non-corporate entity for which accounting standards are made applicable from 1st of April 2020, is it fair enough that that entity partnership firm 40 lakhs turnover should comply with the, all the standards, accounting standards B to 29 barring a one or two exceptions which have been withdrawn? Means the institute has also is wise enough to think that or to consider that it is not appropriate to make all the standards and all the paras applicable for any level of non-corporate entities. So what they have done is they have classified or categorized the entities into four types. The non-corporate entities, the non-corporate entities are classified into four categories. They are classified into four categories. Sometimes I may repeat what I have already said only for the purpose of emphasizing that matter. So please bear me, bear with me in this regard. So it is not wise that all standards are imposed upon every type of non-corporate entity. So for this purpose, what they have done is, they have categorized the entities into four types. Level 1, Level 2, Level 3 and Level 4. You might have already understood that if it happens to be a Level 1 entity, then all the standards will be applicable. 
all paragraphs of all standards without any exception it should be applicable coming to level 2 there might be certain relaxations coming to level 3 still more relaxations coming to level 4 further more relaxations so this is the scheme okay now let us understand as to what do you mean by a level 1 entity so they have prescribed certain conditions or they have categorized certain non-corporate entities as level 1 entities. So who are those level 1 entities? Of course, any entities whose securities are listed or in the process of listing in a recognized stock exchange. Now, what are you talking, Ravi Kishore? You are saying that it is a non-corporate entity and you are saying that the securities are listed on a recognized stock exchange. Friends, a non-corporate entity is not only a proprietor partnership or a uh, HF or a AOP. It can even be a corporation established under a act. A corporation might have issued certain securities. They are eligible to issue securities. Those securities might have been listed in a recognized stock exchange. Then it becomes a level 1 entity or a bank or a financial institution. Now, how can a bank be a non-corporate entity? We already understood that. If it is not established under the Companies Act, if you take the example of a State Bank of India, it is not a bank which is established under the Companies Act. It has a separate act for itself. Or if you take any nationalized bank previously, some have been established under separate acts. In those cases, it is a non-corporate entity. So for them, they are considered as level 1 entity. For the rest of the things, they have given a criteria. They have given a criteria. If your turnover exceeds 250 crores or if your borrowings exceeds 50 crores, if your borrowings exceeds 50 crores or your turnover exceeds 250 crores, then you become a level 1 entity or holding or subsidiary companies of these entities. You will become a level 1 entity. Level 1 entity should comply with all accounting standards. That's what you have to understand. Next comes level 2 entities. So friends, if we take our individual practice, each one of us, if we take the individual practice, now this day you may uh, be bothered that uh, this Ravi Kishore has told that you have to prepare financial statements in accordance with uh, accounting standards. You have to comply that. You have to comply this. You have to come. Now, is it possible for me uh, on this day itself to do or comply with all these requirements? So, friends, we can go step by step. Let us understand. Level 1 entity turnover exceeds 250 crores or borrowings exceed 50 crores. Now, we by ourselves, most of us, if not all, most of us may be having one or two or a very few people or few clients whose turnover exceeds 250 crores. Maybe some of us might not be having a client with a turnover of 250 crores. So we can forget about all those uh, members can forget about level 1 entities. Okay, Or if you have any entity whose turnover is more than 250 crores or whose borrowings is more than uh, 50 crores, then you should keep in mind that for that entity, all the standards are applicable. There is no other way to go. Now come to level 2 entity. 
most of us might be having at least one or two or a few of level two entities. You please understand. Now, what are these level two entities? Turnover is uh, more than 50 crores, but uh, less than 250 crores. More than 50 crores, less than 250 crores. Or borrowings more than 10 crores, but less than 50 crores. So most of us small and medium practitioners, I understand or I am of the view that uh, almost who have joined this uh, 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 seminar might be, uh, if not all, at least most of us might be the small and medium enterprises doing the practice. Now for us, uh, we may be having some number of clients whose turnover is more than 50, but less than 250. Of course, borrowing of 10 crores, uh, I am a little bit uh, skeptical. Uh, of course, our clients will be having a borrowing, but uh, more than 10 crores of a borrowing, uh, a few <coughs> who you might be having. Now, these are level two. They may not be fastened with those many number of standards and paragraphs in those standards, but some relaxations will be there for these type of entities. Now coming to level three entities, <laughs> most of us will be having considerable number of such clients. You examine here. Turnover is more than 10 crores, but less than 50 crores. Borrowings more than 2 crores, but less than 10 crores. Now, all these people come under level 3 entities. That we should understand. Next comes level four entities. Any entity, non-corporate entity, not falling within one, two or three, they come under level four entities. For them, there are many relaxations. Okay. Means whose turnover is less than two crores. Whose turnover is less than 2 crores. Whose turnover is less than 2 crores. That's what we have to understand. Right? Now, level 1 have to comply with all standards. All means all. They have to comply. What about level 2, level 3, level 4? Four entities. For level one, uh, level two, level three, and level four, uh, uh, level four entities, there are certain disclosure relaxations, and there are certain not applicables also. If we take the example of level four entity, AS three is not applicable, and uh, a is 17, A is 18, and uh, 20, 21, 23, 24, 25, 27, not applicable. Okay. So these standards are not applicable for level 4. When you come to level 3, there are certain which are not applicable. Of course, there are certain in certain wherein there are certain disclosure requirement relaxations or exemptions that we need to understand. Of course, friends, this guidance note is freely available for download in our institute website and you can download and wherein all this information has been given. Now, <clears throat> are these accounting standards 
mandatory. Yes. From what date? From the date on which they are made applicable as given in the standards itself. Of course, these are made applicable to a non-corporate entity from 1-4-2020. Now, the duty and responsibility to prepare the financial statements and the preparation of books of accounts is that of the entity. Is that of the entity that we should understand. The entity has to prepare the books of accounts by complying with the accounting standards. Okay. Now what the auditor will do? Auditor audits those financial statements that is understood by everyone. Now what if an entity has not prepared its financial statements in accordance with the accounting standards? Then it is the duty of the auditor to make adequate disclosures in their audit reports of such deviation. So, financial statements are prepared by the entity, they have to follow the accounting standards. If they do not follow the accounting standards, what they have to do? The auditor has to educate the entity, the management of the entity. Still, if they are not in compliance with the accounting standards, what the auditor has to do? He has to qualify his audit report. Right? So, management is responsible for preparation of the financial statements. Now, certain statutes which govern a non-corporate entity, such law itself prescribes that that a non-corporate entity should prepare its financial statements in accordance with the accounting standards. If you take the example of insurance companies, the insurance law itself states that they have to comply with the accounting standards, whatever financial statements that have been prepared by the insurance company, they have to comply with the accounting standards. Likewise, other laws also may prescribe that those financial, their financial statements shall be prepared by complying with the accounting standards. Now, <clears throat> let us say, I am an entity carrying on commercial activity, wholly commercial activity. My turnover is 5 crores. Now, I may fall under a uh, level 3 entity. For me, level 3 entity, some are applicable. Let us say, A is 4, A is 5, A is 7, A is 9 are applicable. Mind you, any one condition or both the condition or sir, the turnover criteria, borrowing criteria, as per my best of my knowledge is or or. Either your turnover exceeds the limit or your borrowing exceeds the threshold limit or is the condition and end is not the condition to the best of my knowledge. Right. <laughs> I am I am speaking of a uh, entity whose uh, turnover is five crores. Let me let, let me say that I am a level three entity, level three entity, and for me, yes, four, five, seven, nine is applicable, and also others like yes, twenty two is applicable, yes, twenty six is also applicable for me. And my dear friends. I hate AS9. I hate AS9. I don't like AS9 and I don't want to comply with AS9. But uh, I will comply AS1, 2, 4, 5, 7, etc. But only 9 uh, I hate. So I don't want to comply with AS9. Does it mean that 
I have complied with the accounting standards while preparing my financial statements. Friends, unfortunately, no. You will be deemed to have complied with the accounting standards only when you have complied with all the standards which are applicable to you. So hating a standard, loving one standard, complying two or three standards, skipping one or two standards will not work. You will be deemed that you have complied with the accounting standards only when you have complied with all the standards which are applicable to you. If you happen to be a level 3 entity, what are all the applicable standards for you? You should comply. That's all. There is no other way. Go. So friends, where I have cast certain doubts in your mind or if I, I have frightened, if not all, at least some of you, by uh, putting forth before you all these uh, compliances, I should also, th I thought that it is fair upon me to suggest the way out. Friends, uh, let me take you to a, let me take you to a publication of our institute by name, Accounting Standards Quick Referencer. So friends, uh, the Accounting Standards book will be this much. Okay. So for a partnership firm, if we want to quickly go through for the compliance of the Accounting Standard, uh, actually, the Accounting Standard Quick Referencer publication has been issued by our institute in the year 2019. Okay or the publication is of uh, to July 2019. If you go to this publication, all the accounting standards, there is a quick reference. For example, if you take the example of disclosure of accounting policies, here what it says, so what are all the major important points which are to be kept in mind as far as AS1 is concerned has been given here. If you go to AS2, what is the uh, uh, bird's eye view or screenshot of AS2 has been given in this publication. Just if we go through this quick reference here, it will be very useful. Okay. This is uh, one publication which I suggest one should go through uh, while uh, especially while you are dealing with uh, non-corporate entities. I will also quickly want to take you through another publication called Disclosure Checklist. So friends, uh, all the way we are discussing that, all the way we are discussing that, you have to ensure, the entity has to ensure that it has complied with the accounting standards while preparing the financial statements. It is the responsibility of the management to ensure that financial statements are prepared in accordance with the accounting standards. Right. What is the duty of the auditor? If they are not prepared in accordance with the accounting standards, the auditor has to consider whether he has to eat the the uh, uh, the Non-compliance is such a material item that it warrants a disclosure or a qualification in his audit report. Is the next consideration what the auditor has to keep in mind. So friends, while uh, auditing the non-corporate entities, you have to ensure that financial statements are prepared in accordance with the accounting standards. Now, all disclosures as required under the each and every standard which is applicable is to be ensured by the auditor. Now, our institute is kind enough that it has come out with a publication called Accounting Standards Disclosure Checklist. 
This is a publication which has been issued in the year 2022. So, an auditor mainly carrying out or at the time of carrying out uh, the audit of a non-corporate entity or for that matter a corporate entity, this uh, publication will be handy to examine whether the entity has complied with the applicable standards. This is a checklist. And this will also work or this will also be like a working paper for the auditor. Let us say, if you take the example of AS1, the quickly you can go through 1.21, whether all the significant accounting policies are disclosed, whether they are forming part of the financial statements, whether they are disclosed at a one place. So if you just go through this checklist, keeping aside your financial statements, this publication will be very much handy for us and will be helpful in complying whatever this guidance note has prescribed for us. So friends, I thought that this is one another publication which will be helpful for all of us. Okay, moving forward, coming to <clears throat> audit of financial statements of a non-corporate entity. We have already dealt with, we have already dealt with the format of financial statements whether they have to be prepared in accordance with accounting standards, what if they are not prepared with account, complying with accounting standards? These already we have discussed. The next thing what we have to keep in mind at the time of audit of a non-corporate entity is that standards on auditing are also to be followed. SCAs are to be followed. Friends, Though you are not speaking or posting in the chat box, some of you, if not all, might be thinking whether all these things are feasible and comparable with the fees what we get. So that question always remains with all of us. But we have to digest the fact that these things are there and at least we should understand that uh, these things have to be kept in mind. And uh, one, uh, one of our members uh, is posing a question as to whether we have to prepare the financial statements as per the formats for the non-corporate SSE for the financial year 23-24. My dear friend, yes. Though this guidance note has come into existence on 1-4-2024 onwards, previously there is a technical guide which was already issued in the year 2022 itself. Okay. So, what will happen if they are not prepared in accordance with that uh, format is a debatable issue. Debatable issue. That is why at the beginning of our discussion itself, we understand, we understood that what is the authority attached to the document issued by the ICA. So, in the beginning of our discussion itself, we went through the authority attached to a document issued by the, by the institute. Okay. So, Though this guidance note is not applicable for 23-24, already there was a technical guide. That is point number one that we have to understand. The other point what we have to understand is, the other point what we have to understand is, give me a second. Right. So one video was disturbing so that uh, I have stopped that video. Right. Prior to this guidance note, there is a technical guide, right? That we have already understood about the technical guide. Keep aside the technical guide. 
from 14-2020 itself, the accounting standards are applicable to non-corporate entities by virtue of the council decision in its 400th meeting. In its 400th meeting. So nonetheless, you follow this format or not is a different issue. But you should definitely comply with the accounting standards and its disclosures for the year 23-24. Because the scheme of applicability of accounting standards to non-corporate entities was in force on and from from on and from 14-2020 itself. That we need to understand. Next comes the question of whether the financial statements are to be prepared in this format following accounting standards in respect of tax audit cases is the next question what we are going to discuss. Friends, at the time of uploading your tax audit report in the CPC website, you are required to attach the financial statements profit and loss account and balance sheet. All of you will agree with me. Right? Now, coming to the format of those financial statements in respect of a tax audit, should we follow or comply with these formats is the next question. What we will be understanding in the coming discussion? Friends, you all know that we have something called as guidance note on tax audit under section 44AB. In the initial days of uh, uh, introduction of tax audit, senior members should appreciate me, should appreciate the fact that there used to be one guidance note. Thereafter, there was uh, an uh, upgrade to the or uh, revised edition. For many years, it was not revised. Again, two years back, the Institute has come out with a guidance note, a revised and updated guidance note, and has told that thereafter, every year, you get a new guidance note, which is applicable for that relevant assessment year. So for the last two years, we are getting a revised edition. We are getting a revised edition. A tax auditor, whether he likes or not, should take into consideration the guidance note on tax audit issued by ICAI while conducting the tax audit. My dear friends, that guidance note on tax audit is so comprehensive that most of your queries will get answered if you refer to that relevant portion of the guidance note in which you have a query. Okay. So, a tax auditor, whether he likes or not, has to carry out the tax audit in accordance with the guidance note issued by the institute with regard to the tax audit. Okay. In that guidance note, in page number 39 of the latest guidance note, means uh, which is uh, assessment year 23-24. That which is applicable to 24-25, I'm afraid, is not at uh, released by ICI. We can we may expect uh, uh, in the near future, but the latest available as per my understanding is relevant to assessment year 23-24. In that publication, if you go to page number 39, in the page number 39 of guidance note, in para number 10, it reads that for certain SSEs like companies, societies, etc., where there is a law governing, the financial statements are prescribed and in case of a certain SSEs, 
law does not prescribe any specific format or requirement. I will read it out for your benefit. For preparation and presentation of financial statements, in such a case, the Accounting Standards Board of ICAI has issued guidelines for form and related preparation and presentation guidelines. These are contained in the ICAI publication. These are contained in ICA publication titled Technical Guide on Financial Statements of Non-Corporate Entities. Tax auditor may consider inviting attention of SSEs towards guidelines appearing in the said publication. That is what it reads. Para number 10.2. Of course, the uh, publication quoted here is of a technical guide because by that time guidance note was not yet issued. Now that guidance note is already issued, you may read it as a guidance note on financial statements and for financial year 23-24, uh, still technical guide holds good. Okay. Next comes. Uh, of course, we have a question from CA Nitin. Uh, we will take it at a later part of our discussion. He is uh, uh, speaking about the turnover with regard to the features and options. Uh, my dear friend, uh, you may refer to the guidance note itself where it has been specifically and categorically stated as to how the turnover is to be computed in respect of futures and options or speculative transactions. And if you happen to be a member of the Vijayada branch, on 23rd of uh, this month, we are having a physical uh, physical session on tax audit wherein a session will specifically cover with regard to the f and transactions and uh, uh, speculative transactions. So, but for now, friends, what we have to understand is in respect of tax audit, the financial statements may have to be prepared in accordance with the technical guide which has been issued or guidance note which has been issued that has been stated in page number 39 of the guidance note, para number 10. So moving forward, so what are financial statements? I need not lecture you about the financial statements and uh, what are the general instructions which are given in the format of these financial statements. Okay. They should give true and fair view that is there. They should comply with the accounting standards. So in the guidance note, in the guidance note, it has been specified that balance sheet profit and loss account cash flow statement notes notes should form part of your financial statements that has been stated and also it has been stated that they should give true and fair you they should comply with the applicable accounting standards in the form as prescribed and the financial uh, statements shall be in the form as that has been provided herein. That's what it has been said. Later, what it has been said is, compliance with requirements of accounting standards, if they require any change in treatment or disclosure, then you can amend or substitute such portions of the format which has been given here. So if your accounting standard or if any law, regulation, etc. prescribes that the disclosure or presentation should be in a particular fashion and the format says otherwise, then you can modify, change or substitute with such requirement. Okay. Next comes. Whatever terminology that has been used in the formats is 
the terminology keeping in mind the commercial transactions the terminology keeping in mind the commercial transactions okay suppose you are doing the uh, audit uh, or you are preparing the entity is preparing the financial statements of a association of persons then in, in this format the term members fund is to be used instead of owners funds so these formats what we are going to discuss herein may contain or may use the terminology owners fund if you are carrying out the or uh, if you are dealing with the financial statement of a aop you can replace it with members funds so friends these format are a sort of guidance to you wherever the necessary adjustments are to be made substitutions are to be made amendments are to be made you are free to do that next what are all the disclosures which have been given in the formats what we are going to discuss are the basic requirements in addition to this if any law or regulation or standards prescribe additional disclosures then you should ensure that those disclosures are made okay next notes should be form part of your financial statements wherever necessary disaggregations are to be made and uh, wherever qualification is not required you may have to go for the necessary information in the notes on accounts and also the balance sheet and profit and loss account should have cross reference to the notes on account should have cross my dear friends in a nutshell what we can understand is the formats are more or less in line with the schedule 3 itself or the already existing profit and loss account formats which are in our written forms some details given in the written forms are are here and also certain information which are required to be uh, disclosed in the financial statements of a corporate entities are also incorporated here okay that we need to understand rounding off is also suggested rounding off is also suggested of course for less than 100 crores and uh, 100 crores or more how it has to be round off is there next comes many number of questions for companies also where rounding off is made mandatory uh, in aoc4 whether you have to give full figures or rounding off is enough that has already been clarified you have to give the full figures there but the attached <coughs> financial statements may contain the rounding off so here also you may get a question that where you are uh, rounding off here whether while preparing the profit and loss account balance sheet in the return form whether you have to give full figures or rounding off one may get a doubt that um, as per my understanding in the uh, return forms we will give the full form and if possible in the financial statements we may have to go for rounding off next comparative figures corresponding or comparative figures are also to be given so friends if you are preparing tally in tally also you can add a column for vertical and uh, for vertical or horizontal for both of them you can add a column of the previous year right in tally also you will get that right now what are all the terms used here in or those which are already used or have the meaning assigned to them in the accounting standards now friends 
as already discussed, most of the time we have went into the conceptual thing of the <coughs> topic of today's topic. Right? Now, we'll go into the format which has been given. So, friends, uh, our institute is kind enough, is kind enough that it not only has given the format in the guidance node, but what they have done is they have even given us the format in Excel sheet, has given us the format in the Excel sheet. Now, this Excel sheet blank format has been given. This is available in our institute website. If you go into our institute website, let me demonstrate that. If we go into our institute website, if you go into the resources and go and click on free download of online publications, free download of online publication, there you go into the accounting standards board. In that, you have something called as technical guides and other material. If you go into that material, here you have, as I was uh, uh, referring earlier in our discussion, there is a separate format for, uh, there is a separate format for LLPs. And here you have this Excel file for illustrative financial statements of non-corporate entities. You can download this uh, uh, Excel file, which is a sort of template, which is a sort of template, and uh, uh, you can use this one, right? This is the place from where I have downloaded this item. So this is the, what is the downloaded file looks like. It is a ready-made format given in Excel file. We can use for preparing the financial statements of our clients. So if we go through these formats, here you can understand in the balance sheet, you have bonus funds, then non current liabilities, current liabilities, you have these uh, uh, current liabilities, thereafter assets, non-current assets, current asset. As already we have seen in the instruction, on the face of the balance sheet, whatever aggregate amount is given, you have, can cross-reference it with a, a note. Okay, then coming to the statement of profit and loss account. What are all the disclosures that have to be made? Next, coming to the notes on account. If you go here, you will have the owner's capital account. There, what is the name of the partner? What is the ratio? Opening balance. Most of us uh, who are dealing in partnership uh, firms are already doing these sort of uh, notes. And coming to the balance sheet, you have to give the disaggregations in the notes on account. So what are what about borrowings? Are they secured? Are they repayable on demand? What are unsecured? What are repayable on demand? And what are the deferred payment liabilities, loans and advances to related parties? So this is a disclosure. This disclosure is as per accounting standard. This disclosure is as per accounting standard because the accounting standard of related parties states that where any uh, transaction has been entered into with a related party, it requires a separate disclosure and it has to be quantified. So here the compliance of account. So previously in our discussion, we understood why these formats are given. These formats are prescribed for the effective implementation of the accounting standards. Okay. Likewise, there are other issues. Even in this, you will get a, uh, if there is a trade payable. This is what I want to refer to you. Because of late uh, 43BH, 
uh, is uh, uh, one of the uh, more discussed about topic in these days. So here in the notes, uh, notes to the financial statements, here we have trade payable. Here we have trade payable. In this trade payable, outstanding dues to the micro, small and medium enterprises is disclosed separately. Now, why this disclosure is made? This disclosure might not have been because of accounting standard. This is because of the MSME Act. The MSME Act states that Jews to the micro, small and medium enterprises have to be disclosed in a particular fashion in the financial statements. <coughs> So, this disclosure is based upon the requirement given in the MSME Act. Okay. So, likewise, you have to give the disclosure requirements. And coming to the balance sheet, this is with regard to the depreciation. Most of us for company SSEs or all of us for companies SSEs, we are a used to these type of formats, preparation of financial statements. And coming to <coughs> balance sheet notes for uh, other like uh, uh, loans and advances, what are the capital advances, what are the other loans and advances, all these things have been given. And coming to the profit and loss account also, uh, what are all the different uh, uh, revenues and uh, what are the revenues from operations? what are the other revenues, cost of goods, etc., 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 and uh, coming to other expenses. Coming to other expenses. This all of us know there is a specific criteria, uh, one percentage of turnover or uh, uh, a threshold limit, whichever is high, have to be, uh, uh, they are considered to be material items and they require separate disclosure. All these things we are well aware of. So friends, uh, I'm afraid uh, we are left with uh, eight more minutes. So these are all the things which uh, I wanted. Uh, yeah, of course, medium enterprises are not uh, covered by 43BH. Eh? Though medium enterprises are not covered by the 43BH, the MSME Act is applicable to medium enterprises also. They do not get any special benefit as per that act. But this disclosure requirement is even applicable in respect of medium enterprises. So the disclosure requirement is there for them also. 43BH, yes, uh, uh, accepted. It is not applicable to uh, medium enterprises. It is applicable only to micro and small enterprises. So friends, uh, this is what, uh, of course, we, we, we spent a very little bit of time on uh, the formats per se, uh, but I thought that uh, the conceptual understanding is more important in this regard because these uh, formats, uh, uh, you very well know uh, now that uh, uh, these are available free for download at our institute website and you can download and everyone can uh, go through those uh, requirements and formats. And also, uh, you may use it for your clients. So, friends, uh, this is what uh, uh, I wanted to convey out of my uh, little understanding of this uh, topic. And uh, now, all of us uh, may uh, discuss uh, mutually uh, of uh, any other thing. Uh, so, Ramesh, is it... Uh, open for everyone to unmute themselves. So if anyone want to pose a query in this regard, you may please go ahead. Sir Ganapati. I think everyone is uh, free to unmute themselves. Ganapati sir has raised his hand. So you may please uh, unmute yourself, sir, and speak. Ganapati. 
Nitin raised his hand. Ganapati sir raised his hand. I think uh, you should be able to unmute yourself uh, to speak. Sir, good evening. Yeah, good evening, sir. Please go on. Uh, now, my question was, when we, as an accountant, when we enter for future and option, so we have to make the accounting entries on day-to-day -day basis. So today I bought some for 1 lakh rupees and the profit is ultimately 20,000. Okay. So as per guidance note, that 20,000 will be counted as turnover. But as far as the books is concerned, then how to record in the books? You don't have to re record 1 lakh transaction purchase or, and 1 lakh 20 sales. Sir, in the books also, sir, I will, uh, I would like to invite your attention to our institute publications. Yes, sir. There is a publication called Accounting for Derivatives. Right. Accounting for Derivatives is uh, one of the publication of the yes. institute that uh, we can uh, refer one thing. As mm. per my understanding, mm. in the, uh, recording of the books also, it is not necessary for us to record the, uh, uh, what you call, uh, uh, trade value. Transaction. Tra trade value need not be recorded I, 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 in, in my understanding. You can even record uh, the profit of profit or loss, which you have derived from that. You are speaking of a speculative transaction or a features and options, sir? Both, sir. Both the principles are more or less same. Uh, the principles are more or less same, yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, as per my understanding, what we can do is, while calculating the turnover, what we have to do is, the absolute values we have to take. That, yeah, that's correct. But that we, I, now I'm on the accounting, actual accounting yes, and sir. reconciliation of that. Yes, sir. Account. Accounting. Accounting, I am I am coming, sir. Yes, sir. One way of preparing the profit and loss account is mm -hmm. you can take favorable balances. Favorable right. balances from options. Yeah. Favorable balances from futures. Yes, favorable sir. balances from speculative transactions. Right. You can take the unfavorable balances from options, futures, and speculation. Right. You can go with the uh, to turnover charges to brokerage. Uh, we understand that this business income, you can even claim the security transaction tax also. If it happens to be a capital gain, you can't claim the security transaction tax. But right. here you can claim the STT also. Now yes. here comes the net profit. Right. Here comes the net profit. Yeah. This is how you can prepare the profit and loss account even if it is subjected to audit. Of course, for if you are carrying out only uh, a, a person is carrying out only features and options speculative transactions, then what he can do is, uh, now you have this uh, extended limit of uh, 10 crores for uh, tax audit. Right. 44 AB, because uh, you will get into uh, first proviso to 44 AB1. Yes, sir. That will be applicable to you, 5%, 5%. Right. Sir. Right. Now, this can be your profit and loss. Let us say your turnover calculated on absolute values. How right. turnover, sir, determining the turnover for the purpose of applicability of tax audit right. is different with the profit or loss arranged and profit and loss account and balance sheet being prepared by us. Right. The way in which you have to, the manner and procedure in which you have to determine the turnover for these transactions is already given in the guidance note also. And in the guidance note itself, as per my understanding, if I remember correctly, they also stated that 
determining the turnover is different and the preparation of profit and loss account balance sheet is different as far as these transactions are concerned. That's correct. Okay. So, yes. while preparing the books, you can even go with the net balances. Right. And as per my understanding, it will be appropriate to prepare the books by the net balances only. Instead of going into the uh, that what you call uh, the uh, value. transaction value itself, gross right. value itself, ah, okay. you can prepare the profit and loss account like this. And uh, if you are only, if your uh, uh, SSE is only into these type of transaction, else and uh, coming to the balance sheet, you can prepare a simple balance sheet. <coughs> and also, for futures and options, which mm. are not a settled transactions. Maybe yeah. on uh, March 28th or 29th, you may, you may have entered into a call 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 option, but it yeah. is not yet settled on 31st of uh, uh, March. Yeah. In that case, you need not count that. You have to count that only in the year in which where it is ultimately settled. Okay. Yeah, but... Uh, uh, in the balance sheet and profit and loss account, you might have to take that closing stock. We have to take mark to market value? Uh, uh, as per my understanding, cost you have to take. Okay. You you have to take a cost. You, 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 may, you may go with the cost or if you, you are a uh, Current market price uh, as on 31st March is less than that, then it uh, uh, as per the applicable standards, etc. Of course, this is no there is no specific standard for this. You may have to take the uh, market value then if it is less than that. Right. So if you are uh, whichever is less, mm. you have to take as per my understanding. So if the uh, future or option is not settled on the balance sheet date then you have to take the opening stock as well as the closing stock. Of course, you might, uh, most of the people uh, might not be having that. Uh, but uh, in some cases, it is possible. And in the balance sheet, you can take the closing stock and uh, you might be maintaining, uh, you will be having a ledger account with that uh, uh, sub broker. Uh, generally, it won't be in a liability side. Definitely, it will be on the asset side in most of the uh, yeah. and most of the cases uh, they yeah. won't give credit so yeah. you will have that uh, uh, sub broker account you have this closing stock uh, if you are having a separate bank account for this you may also maintain the bank account of course uh, the bank which you are using for these futures and options and uh, speculation that bank account you can give of course I don't think uh, uh, you will be having any cash right that's correct uh, right. And uh, you can take uh, uh, the difference as your capital. Yes. Then we use the bank account for personal as well as the future option, say, for example. Then we don't mention the bank account in the balance sheet because we consider it as a personal. Yes, personal. Yes. But yeah. of course, uh, the uh, whatever money which is unsettled, and which you have invested, yeah, you which you have invested or is lying with your sub broker will yeah. be taken care by the closing stock and the, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, the sub broker account. Right, sir. Right. Thank you very much, sir. Very Thank well you. explained. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, friends, uh, I'm afraid that uh, we have ran out of time, and I thank all of you for your uh, patience listening. And also I may tell you that uh, this uh, <clears throat> will be available uh, for watching any number of times in our Vijayada Branch YouTube channel. If anyone want to or share with your friends, you can definitely do it. So thank you very much uh, for attending and listening patiently to me. See you next time.